Hi, I'm David Spender. Uh, I'm an application engineer. I've been an application engineer for the last four years, uh, and before that, a design engineer for four years. Hi, I am Scott Cumberland. I have been a design engineer for the last 14 years. Perfect. So, uh, Scott, we are here to discuss our uh, engineering experience and design mm -hmm. experience in uh, user interface. Uh, yeah, so like, what, uh, what is an application engineer and what exactly do you do throughout your day, I guess? Yeah, that's a good question. I get that a lot. So an application engineer uh, takes in the voice of the customer, mm -hmm. uh, understands their needs, and then finds a product that suits their application. Hence why application engineer. So uh, my day-to-day -day, uh, is really different as you uh, see in my role. Mm -hmm. um, it can go from uh, a day of customer heavy calls, uh, getting technical information and understanding what their needs are, mm -hmm. uh, to quoting those needs, uh, producing something, designing something that fits uh, their application, to working with production to uh, maybe troubleshoot issues or figure out how to create samples uh, or parts for a customer as well. So cool. it really changes up day to day. Yeah. Yeah. Good deal. Uh, what inspired you to uh, to go down the route of an engineer? Yeah, I think uh, I'll have probably a cliche answer that most <laughs> engineers will give, which is, uh, as a kid, I like to tinker with stuff, build stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably had the same thing. Big Lego guy, I love building Legos. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, seventh grade, I spoke with one of my relatives. He was a mechanical engineer uh, and that got the my mind thinking, hey, this seems like something that I want to do. And I think seventh grade, I was in the public library on the like the open public computers looking at like the best engineering schools to go to. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think since seventh grade, I had my heart set on it and didn't really deviate yeah. from it and went for it. So cool. uh, here I am uh, eight years into the engineering uh, industry at this point. So yeah, yeah. how about yourself? Uh, yeah, kind of same thing um, growing up was a huge Lego person. Uh, didn't really have the kit, so it was like, it was always just getting like bulk Legos and coming up with whatever designs could come up with with yeah. the uh, Legos that we had. And uh, I like to draw as well a lot, so kind of having both <clears throat> aspects of doing the stuff with hand on the, like with the Legos, but then also drawing. Um, Definitely did not know at seventh grade that was my plan <laughs> whatsoever. Um, but just like kind of as I got older, planners around like never really did much with computers other than just your normal like in school stuff and then like some games. Um, but then just kind of as I like found out more about the different things you could do mm -hmm. drawing wise on a computer, kind of led me to start looking that route, just knowing that. I wasn't as much of a, somebody that would be doing like hands-on stuff. Like my dad was a mechanic, mm -hmm. knew there was no way I was going to be doing that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I was always intrigued with like just how the, the stuff my dad did do, like kind of intrigued with how that stuff was made. Um, so I, I kind of just one thing led to another and that's what I ended up going to school for. Nice. Here we are. Yeah, here we are. Yeah. Yeah, so with uh, Butler Technologies, we, uh, we have the opportunity to work in a variety of industries when it comes to uh, the medical industry, the uh, industrial industry, uh, data centers, um, automotive, safety equipment, uh, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a favorite industry that you like to work with? I really don't. Um, I think the biggest thing would just be I have like different design stuff, I guess, that stands out more. Mm -hmm. um, and so really it kind of just depends on what different industries are going for it at times. So obviously within each industry, you have the same types of products from one customer to the next. So it is kind of, it is whatever is kind of like the thing, I guess, right then yeah. that they're trying to use to like just draw everybody's attention to their product. Like what makes theirs better than their competitor's version. I think it's really more like that's what kind of draws me to like just multiple industries that I that I like yeah. to work with. I feel like we get it a lot when we're doing tours or something or talking to people and uh, they'll respond with, oh, it's just a label. And it's, it's yeah. not, there's artwork yeah. to it, right? For like sure. it's user interface. 
It is um, understanding, right, um, not just our customer, but their customers, uh, what yeah. their preferences are, what mm -hmm. they're looking for, how do they want to interact with something. So yeah. uh, it's not just a label. No. I always have to correct no, people when not. they say that. Yeah. So, yeah. What, uh, what would you say the most surprising thing is with our field that people do not know? Hmm. That's a good question. I would say the 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 day-to-day -day challenges um, again kind of going back to the just the label thing mm -hmm. i think people think it is easier than they than it looks yeah and it's not um just understanding how many colors you want and what the the font should look like i mm -hmm. mean there's so much detail within everything and that's just that is for a label when you go into membrane switches or other uh, user interfaces i mean then you're talking leds other surface mounted devices, windows, um, uh, opacity, density, what's mm -hmm. it covering up, what are you trying to do, um, whether it comes to uh, tactile feel, um, how you want uh, your domes to feel, uh, your metal yeah. domes. Like, I mean, there's so many different gram force that you can use. It's, it's like, there's so much to it. So uh, it's, not, uh, it's not as simple as I think uh, people make it out to be, which makes our lives very interesting because yeah. it's so different day to day uh, for each industry that we work with. Yeah, and I feel that also like that changes from industry to industry, especially whenever you're talking in terms of if it if the workers are going to have gloves on or not. Yeah, like it's one of the biggest things that is hard to plan for, um, especially if it's a if it's something that's outside, if it's something that can be outside all the time you're obviously going to be dealing with it in different temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so like, yeah, if customers are wanting to be able to still have like good feedback with their equipment, no matter what, uh, what the operator is wearing, it kind of can definitely add some, uh, some challenges to yeah. it for sure. Yeah, whether they're wearing like thick working gloves yeah. or yeah, the yep. outdoor environment, you were just getting done doing a water ingress test the other day. So yeah. that was really cool to see making sure nothing gets in the way of mm -hmm. uh, the feel or feedback that you're getting. Yeah. So, yeah. Neat. Um, I know you've been uh, working on like a, a pretty big membrane switch yeah. recently, right? Yes, there was a lot of, uh, lot of backlighting with the, uh, with the switch that you're referring to. Uh, I think one of, the, one of the cool things with that one, so typically, whenever you have a, sw a membrane switch, a lot of times the customer will have a, like, a larger user interface, but it will only be like a small portion of that is actually the switch. Mm -hmm. This one, the entire thing had buttons on it. That's massive. There was lighting at the top, there were buttons down the both sides of it, the whole way across the bottom. Yeah. Um, so from a, a design aspect of it, uh, I mean, that. I always like challenges with the switches. It's basically, I mean, each one is a, another puzzle that you get to solve, basically. Yeah. And uh, one like that, having a full keyboard and then some in terms of buttons on it, yep. there's obviously, there was a lot of, uh, of starting over on uh, trying to get traces routed where they needed to be. Yeah. Um, different challenges with the backlighting because and we do backlighting a good amount but they had different spots throughout the whole uh, design that they wanted to have backlighting on mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of narrow areas with it which then led to other challenges with the backlighting because their the housing that it was going into um, just towards the top of it, there was light that was originally getting through. Mm -hmm. So then yeah, we had to figure that. out how to get rid of the, the light bleed because um, when it was being seen during the day, it wasn't very noticeable, but typically their, uh, the product was gonna be used indoors, typically decently well lit areas, but you could still see like a glow coming out of it that yeah. just made it not look like a, a good finished product. So kind of had to go back through figure out material that could be placed into that area to not allow any more of the uh, the light to supposed to just be lighting up their logo yeah. to not go out the top of the uh, of the design. Yeah, so. so you talked a little bit about the challenges in designing a big membrane switch mm -hmm. like that. Now that one in particular, um, I think right the customer came to us and uh, really wanted to use our expertise yeah. in uh, the design, whether it came to the graphics, the layout, the size, and everything. Mm -hmm. 
um, how did how do we like take on that challenge? Like, how did you face that? How did you work with the customer in order to uh, basically start from scratch and help them out the best way we could? Yeah, um, yeah, that was a neat one, and uh, for sure because of they knew they had a general idea of what they wanted. They knew what they they knew what it needed to do in the end, but they didn't really know how to like to get it started. And so between myself and then our graphics department, we kind of basically took their basic napkin sketches that they had and were able to kind of just come up with a couple of different designs. Originally, just graphic wise, uh, button location wise, it was similar to what they were originally asking for, but just a little bit of variation just so that they had a couple of different options to, uh, to choose from. And then I believe on that one we did a couple of different prototype runs of it, yep. kind of ironed some different things out with it, and then, uh, yeah, ended up with the design that was in the end provided to them. Yeah, I remember graphics working on that a lot. I think mm -hmm. we gave them, what, two iterations of four different designs of different texts. I think we ended up uh, having their logo was like glossed and everything, yeah. which looked really nice. I was yeah. a big fan of that. And then right, lighting up their logo on the top. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a cool project to see you go through. Yeah, for sure. Sorry. Yeah, it's definitely one of the cool things with uh, just with the way that we're able to do uh, the graphic stuff. Like you said, the gloss and the texture look like basically we can do that with anything. Yeah. Like whether it's a full logo, whether it's uh, just some simple text that gets relieved of of texture, just to kind of just add another to add something else that catches your eye with that product that draws you to uh, to that design. Yeah. Yeah, so you you had mentioned with it how it was a larger design. I said, yeah, typically, I mean, you'll have, I don't know, switches anywhere from literally like an inch and a half by two inches mm -hmm. up to, I think, on average, I would say probably the largest switches we deal with are like anywhere from like five to seven inches long um, where this one was, I believe, it's like eight and a half by 11 of most. So it's basically massive. just take a full sheet of your regular printing paper and that was the size of this. Yeah. Um, so then that, trying to get accurate measurements with that uh, became challenging because your standard calipers only go up to like six inches. Yeah. And then by the time you get your longer calipers, it kind of just gets a little bit harder yeah. to, uh, to be able to accurately measure that. Um, and the so, membrane switch is flexible, right? So yeah, there's a bit of yeah, play to keep, into the whole yeah, thing. Yeah, trying to keep it flat, trying to keep the calipers from like being like at a slight angle because then I can throw it off, especially over such a long distance like that. Yeah. Um, and so we have other machines that we've used for taking measurements, which I believe you're a little bit more familiar with. Yeah, uh, the machine we have is our CMM. Uh, the okay. brand name is Microview. Uh, and uh, I love using that thing. Uh, we like to use it at uh, Butler Technologies. Um, again, CMM machines are very accurate. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's really nice is not only can it pick up on uh, outside perimeter edges, but you can also pick up on graphic uh, edges as well. Okay. So right when we uh, print buttons down uh, inside of a graphic, uh, we can actually pick up locations there. Uh, a lot of times customers give us drawings that verify from maybe a uh, perimeter edge to the 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 A button or the number one mm -hmm. button or something like okay. that. So um, yeah, we we like to use our CMM machine for accurate measurements and mm -hmm. quality checks and first article inspections and uh, all that fun stuff. So Excellent. it's a really neat machine. It's really powerful and uh, it's cool to use. So. Very cool. So what's uh, what's an emerging trend in user interface design that you think will kind of shape the future? Um, so I think one of the biggest things is. It seems like every time a customer comes to us with a new design, like a lot of times we'll have stuff that they have a, like basically a version one of, and then they're coming to us for version two. A lot of times that version two is seeing how many more buttons or LEDs they can fit into the already very uh, uh, overpopulated area, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like a lot of a lot of times like they're just trying to be able to get more of it on our portion of it instead of what we're like cause at the end of it our tail from the switches is going to then plug into 
a rigid board that they have on their end, okay. which that stuff can typically be a little bit more costly to add stuff to. So they go, I think a lot of times they're then going the route of trying to have it go to our side where we're able with the, with being able to print the traces, we can make changes to it at a much more uh, effective cost to it than having to have a board completely redesigned. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like, yeah, the more, the smaller the pieces can get, like uh, the domes, the LEDs, mm -hmm. we can even place resistors if need be on, uh, on our circuits. Um, and so yeah, they're always just trying to, again, try to, trying to get as much onto the user interface portion of the design as they can. Yeah. Yeah, feeding off of that, I think, a lot of the shows we've been going to and uh, the new technologies that, that's coming out, like everything's getting smaller electronically. Yeah. So yep. um, like you said, getting more stuff on the uh, user board inside of their user interface. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's uh, some cool stuff coming out there, whether it's smaller LEDs, smaller chips, smaller resistors, uh, capacitors, yeah. what have you. Yeah. Um, I think smaller those get, the more intricate we can get with the user interface. And I think yeah. we can really put together a, a solution that uh, fits everyone's requirements. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that, that looks like the, uh, I think that's a, a big part of the future of what user interface looks like. But to not end on such a heavy note, yeah. talking yeah. about uh, what the future holds, uh, maybe a little more of a fun question. What do you, uh, what do you like to listen to when you're designing a, a nice challenging uh, membrane switch? Uh, a little bit of everything, and unlike most people that say that they listen to a little bit of everything, I feel like I truly do listen to a little bit of everything, but my main uh, main go-to is uh, some heavy metal. Uh, <laughs> it just, no matter what type of mood I'm in, no matter what I'm designing, like that's just, that is my go-to. Yeah, puts you in yeah. the zone to get as many yeah. traces up Help. as much. Yep, yeah. helps drown out the the rest of the noise uh, around me the, the best. Yeah. And well, I sit next the, to you, so I'll yeah. take that as an offense. If you see, if you see, <laughs> my, uh, if you see my head moving, you know there's typically something a little bit heavier playing. Nice. Nice. How about yourself? Um, oh, geez. I, I, go, I don't know, pop? Pop music? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's out there. It's, it's like got, it alternative, has its, it has its uh, alternative indie pop. I don't, I don't know, but other times, uh, I, yeah, no music on like to hear the surroundings yeah and uh can't do podcasts though no. if i uh if i listen to podcasts and i'm typing an email i'm gonna just be typing exactly what i'm hearing so yeah i can't be doing that too often yeah i feel the same it's too easy to uh to get drawn into a podcast where music it can just be it just flows background, in the background noise and yeah exactly keep you focused yeah well scott uh thanks for sitting down with me i mm -hmm. think uh, this was a great conversation to have so uh hopefully we'll have more of these right yeah cheers man Yes.